God, thank you, Lord. You're in for a treat this afternoon. There's a man in a green shirt out the front who's praying at the moment. He's come all the way from America to join an Australian revival. Amen. <laughs> it's true. And God, was, and God let him in. So he's one of us. <laughs> so he's one of us, okay? <laughs> he was here last year with our brother Greg Morgan, and they blessed us incredibly. So I just want you to give this man a great big hand as he ministers this afternoon. Jim Rogers, God bless you. <laughs> wow. Thank you. It's fun to be back. It's a little bit less flies this year than last year, which is a nice thing, isn't it? Yeah. Oh. <clears throat> now we got to shift from ministry back into what we're doing, right? You know, um, as I was preparing to, to talk to say, I was just praying with the Lord, and I've got really good news for you guys. God is in a really good mood. He's not concerned about what's going on in the economy. And believe me, coming from the United States, there's a lot of people who are concerned about the economy. He's not concerned about whether or not this country or that country is having issues. It doesn't bother him. He knows what's going to happen. And he's anxious for us to step into what we're supposed to be doing in that time. You know, you've been hearing a lot about the Father's love, and you need to really get that in your heart. If you don't know him as a loving father, it's really hard to go out and do what he's calling you to do. If you don't release the ministry that he's giving to you from a loving heart, you know, Paul tells us it's like a clanging cymbal. Everything that we do should be done from a position of love. We are to release the father's love in everything that we do. When we go up and meet someone and pray for them, the worst thing they should do is walk away feeling the love of God. That's a bare minimum. I mean, it's, it's when we walk into some place, we change the atmosphere because we carry the love of the Father. And if you're not releasing that when you're in a place, why not? We're not supposed to be part of the problem. We're supposed to be the solution to the problem. And so part of what we have to do is take what we have and give it away. If you're holding on to it and you're keeping it inside of yourself, it makes you feel really good. But what's the point in that? You should be feeling good all the time anyway. If you truly know who you are, the circumstances that are around you don't matter. There's no point in us focusing on what the enemy's doing. There really isn't. I would rather focus on what God's doing. The whole issue is if we focus on what God's doing, what the enemy's doing becomes really small and insignificant. I love being around people who all they want to do is talk about what God's doing. Amen. It's been so much fun to hang out with the speakers and stuff. And we've been in, what are we talking about? What God's doing. You know, I remember the first time I went to a, a breakfast with a man. I, how many people here know who Randy Clark is? Everybody? Some of you? Okay. I had the privilege of going to a breakfast with Randy. And I walked up to the table and they were talking about raising the dead. And I thought, you know, I want to go to breakfast like that. It's a whole lot more fun to talk about what God's doing than what he's not doing. What's God doing? He is going out to the nations and having miracles, signs, wonders, you name it, it's happening. In this last year alone, I've seen three people get raised from the dead. <clears throat> Praise God. You know, that's an amazing thing. Two of those were in the same day. God wants to see us move beyond what we're familiar with and what we're comfortable with. If you start to limit what God can do based on your experience, you'll never experience anything. It's true. How do you pray for some, how do you expect to see if someone raised from the dead if you've never prayed for him? But if you don't have the courage to believe that he can do something you haven't seen, you won't pray for them. Right? How about blind eyes? How many people here have seen blind eyes open when they've prayed for them? Raise your hand. There's a few of you here. You know what? By the end of this year, every one of you should have seen it. 
Every one of you should be able to see deaf ears open. Every one of you should be able to see all the things that are in the Bible. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's not changing. So guess what? If he's opening blind eyes last year, he's still opening them. Right? If he's raising the dead. You know that more people have been raised from the dead since the year 2000 than an entire history of earth before. It's true. It's happening now on a regular basis. That should excite you. <laughs> if not, you might want to check your pulse. <laughs> God is doing things that we've not seen before. God is now going, taking us to the next level. He said greater works than these we would do. Now that's kind of scary if you've read your Bible. If you actually read what it says and then you realize he's telling you, you know what? You're going to do more than that. What's that supposed to look like, Lord? What's it supposed to look like? Well, you know what? He's creative. And he's constantly bringing things to us, new things to us. Nothing will ever go against what his word says. But just because it's different doesn't mean it's not him. In fact, if it's different, it probably is him because he doesn't want you to be comfortable. I don't know about you, but I, have, I learned a long time ago, comfort was not in the agenda. He loves it when I get nervous. <laughs> it's his favorite thing to do to me. He loves to take me into a situation, put me in front of something and say, well, now what are you going to do? Well, you have a choice. You can be afraid of it. Or you can say, okay, Lord, we're here together. Release your power and let it happen. I take people on teams to Africa all the time, all over the world. And they'll always get ready and they're like, yes, we're there. And they want to pray for people. And then you put them out in front of a crowd and there's 200, 300 people running towards them. And they get scared. <laughs> they get to determine, are they going to try and do this in their own strength? Or are they going to rely on the Father? Well, I've seen people do it in their own strength. Doesn't work real well. But those that are relying on the Lord get to see all the wonderful things that he wants to do. He wants to touch this entire continent that you live on. Do you realize that? There's a revival that's coming to this nation, to this continent, that's going to start here. This place is going to burn. It's going to burn with Holy Spirit fire. And what's going to happen is that fire is going to go across to the other nations. But it's not going to happen if you sit inside the tent. If you're not willing to go out and do it, guess what? He'll have to find someone else to do it. Now, that sounds really strange, doesn't it? But you know what? He loves the people so much, he won't give up. I love the story. I love Peter. He's one of my favorite people in the Bible. If you think about Peter, here he is. He's a fisherman. He's uneducated. Probably swore a ton. Didn't... Uh, that probably wasn't a real nice guy to be around, if you think about it. Most of those guys really weren't pleasant. And here Jesus takes him and brings him alongside of him. He knows who he is. There's no secrets there, right? And you know what we see in the book of Acts? Here Peter is. He gets up in front of a crowd and 3,000 men get saved from his message. I don't think he went to seminary. I don't think he went to high school. But God flowing through him releases that. You know, here's the guy who takes out his sword and cuts off the ear of the people trying to take Jesus into custody. Remember? That's my kind of guy. <laughs> it's like, okay, Lord, I'll help you out. <laughs> he does all these strange things, and guess what? God still loves him so much that he moves through him. He got to a place where he would walk down the streets of Jerusalem and his shadow would heal people. How many people here have their shadow healing people? I saw a hand up in the back. I know now that Raph is... We'll pray for you later. <laughs> I want my shadow to heal people. I do. I have seen thousands and thousands of people get healed over these last few years. Last year alone, I saw... Um, we figured out over 100,000 healings in one year. But my shadow isn't healing people. 
I want it that way. I want to be like that. And here's this guy, he's this ruffian, he does all that, and God knows his heart. I think it all started back when Peter stepped out of the boat. If you read the story, it's in Matthew 14, verse 21 or 22. I think it's 21. It starts in. You know, Jesus sends them off. He's been preaching. He's been ministering. He sends them off in the boat. And, of course, they get the big waves and all that. And what do they have? Jesus walking on the water. And guess what happens? Everybody gets scared. <laughs> they think it's a ghost, Right? And he says to him, no, it's me. Now, there's 12 of them in that boat. One guy had the faith to actually say, if it's you, tell me to come out to you. Now, how many people step out of a good boat? Most of you here sail, I know that, because you live right next to the ocean, right? Can you imagine going out on the ocean, and all of a sudden the waves are kicking up, and there may be eight-foot waves, Pretty good sized wave. Not, not huge, but good enough to make you feel them, right? And suddenly you're going, oh, I'm going to step off the boat and go out and walk on the water. Everybody wants to do that, right? <laughs> By the way, it's not faith unless you keep your cell phone in your pocket. Just so you know. <clears throat> if you're going to try walking on the water, you've got to do it with the cell phone in your pocket. It's true. The, the Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry, the kids have started to, they, they believe God will do everything that he says in the book, right? So they've actually started going to the pool and trying to walk on water. And the standard line is, they say it's not faith unless you keep your cell phone in your pocket. It's true. I like it. The other one that they're doing, Jesus walked through walls. Right? When he got, came back in his resurrected body, he walked through the wall into the room where the men were. So guess what they're trying to do now? They're trying to walk through walls. <laughs> There's a story. They were at this place, and they hear, this pastor hears this thudding against the wall, and he's going, what in the world is going on? And he walks out, and these kids are walking straight into the wall and bouncing off. And he's like, what are you doing? And he said, well, Jesus walked through walls. Do you have the faith to believe that what he said in the book is true? Peter took it to a level, didn't he? And it was the start of it for him. Think about it. He actually walked out of the boat, stepped out on the water, and he was walking on water. He was walking towards Jesus, and then what happened? He took his eyes off the Father. And when he did that, he sank. Now the other 11 are probably sitting in there going, I knew that was going to happen, right? Isn't that how we look at things? Well, the person comes up for healing and they get prayer and they didn't get healed. Well, I knew that was going to happen. I grew up in the Lutheran Church in the United States. That's how we believed. We didn't believe. We believe. Oh, yeah, the gifts are all real. But they don't happen now. Talk about a lie from the pit. The enemy doesn't want us operating in the gifts, does he? He doesn't want us doing the stuff. Why? Because an encounter that comes with the power of God involved in it will change hearts. Have you ever tried to have an intellectual argument with someone from Islam? It doesn't work. I go to Pakistan all the time. I've got a, one of my spiritual fathers goes and I go with him. <clears throat> and... You cannot have an intellectual or theological argument with a Muslim. You know why? They believe there are three holy books. They believe that the Torah is a holy book of God. They believe that the Bible is a holy book and that the Quran is a holy book. And the only reason you guys aren't Muslims is because you've never had the final revelation. Well, if that's true, how do you argue with someone who's already thinking they're in a superior position? doesn't work. But you know what does work? When their deaf ears open. When they have blind eyes that open because everybody in the, in the mosque knows who these people are. And they know what's going on. And I got news for you. When God shows up in that kind of power, they want to know who he is. Because Allah doesn't heal. They have to have it. Paul told us that the gospel was meant to be accompanied by signs and wonders. 
So that it's not by the persuasive words of the preacher or anyone else, but by the power of God that they come to know who he is. And if we're not carrying the power of God in our message, we've missed the boat. We're playing Nerf Church. Now, I don't know about you, but when I go into battle, I really don't want to have a Nerf sword. I want one of those that William Wallace had. They're about this tall. If you're going to go to war, let's go to war. Let's not sit here and think that we can take them on and do it with some kind of, well, I can talk them into it. No, you cannot. <laughs> exactly. You'll talk them out of it. You are not going to be able to talk people into what you want to do. But you know what? God doesn't want you to talk about it. He wants you to demonstrate the power that he has. He wants you to take everything that he's given to you and then give it away. Now that doesn't make much sense in our world. If I take my car keys and give them to Raph, I don't have my car anymore, as you well know. <laughs> right? But in the kingdom, you know what ends up happening? I get two or three more. You cannot outgive God. You can't give away more than he's going to give to you. In fact, if you prove faithful to giving it away, he'll give you more. The people who don't get more are the ones who like to sit on it. Because he figures, why give them more? They're not using what I gave them. All these prophetic words that were given out today, you know what? If you're going to just sit on them, not much is going to happen for you. You need to step into them. You need to activate them. Start to use what God's given to you. How many of you have received a prophetic word in the last year? Raise your hands. How many of you have seen those prophetic words activated in your life? It's about half the number that just raised their hand the first time. The rest of you, step into them. If you're not stepping into the word that God gave to you, you'll never see it activate. Because this is going to sit there. It's a promise that God gave to you that you can activate and go into. The Lord told me a few years ago I'd go to the nations. I'd never been outside the country. Well, I'd been outside the country when I was in the, in the military, but <laughs> I've never been outside the country. It's not something where I traveled a lot. And I thought to myself, you've got to be kidding me. I've been to 47 nations. You have to be willing to step into what God has told you to do. He will take what you've take, whatever step you take and he'll multiply it out. If you're willing to go up and risk it and pray for the person who's blind, what's going to happen? Yeah. So a lot of people say, well, if, what if I pray for him and nothing happens? I like to say, what if you pray for him and something does? Let's focus on what he's doing. The blind man at the pool of Bethesda, don't you love that story? Right? Jesus heals him. <clears throat> what about the rest of them that were sitting there? What do you think we'd be talking about today in the media? <laughs> Not the guy who got healed, the other ones. We want to focus on what he's doing. Because when we focus on what he's doing, it builds us up. <clears throat> it gives us faith to believe in it. One of the reasons why we love to share testimonies is because it builds your faith. Do you know what the word testimony means in Greek? It means to do it again. God uses testimony so that we can say, Lord, do that again. When you hear the stories that all are coming out of here, you know what? <clears throat> Pardon me. You can take that and stand on it and use it as a testimony to move forward. Even though you may have never seen it before in your own life, that doesn't mean it won't happen. Catherine and I were talking about walking out, levitating over crowds. Right? There are people who have had that happen. We both think it'd be really fun to do it. We're like, Lord, we want that anointing. So we're going to stand on that. Now, that's going to be interesting to see which one of us actually has the nerve to step off the stage <laughs> out over the crowd, but we'll figure that out. You won't see things happen unless you step into it. God can pour all the anointing he wants to into you this weekend. He can release gifts to you. He can just cover you so much that you drip with oil. And if you walk out of the tent and go home and think, wow, that was a great tent meeting, you've missed it. Because you haven't taken that and now used it. 
God is not interested in us putting on a bad... We, we have Boy Scouts in the United States. I don't know if you have them here or not. But they get these ba banners that have all these little merit badges on them. That's not what he's interested in. He wants someone who's going to take the toolbox and actually go use it. Because if you're actually using it, now you're, ca you're taking the kingdom and you're advancing it. If you want to see revival start, you're going to have to advance the kingdom. Because revival is not going to start by the church coming to a meeting. Do you realize that when the church comes to a meeting and all this happens, this is renewal. He's renewing us. He's getting us ready for what? For revival. Because revival is when the lost come in. We saw a little bit of a taste so far this, this, at this meeting. And praise God, the angels rejoice with every soul that comes into the kingdom. But that number needs to be in the thousands times that. I had the blessing of being in a Western African nation. And we were doing open air crusades in a stadium. In a four day period we had 150,000 salvations. That's not because of anything special that we did. That was because of what God was doing. We just got to be a part of it. We got to watch it happening. That's what he wants to do. It's no longer a time for us to be fishing with poles. Get the nets out. Because you know what? We don't have enough time to fish by poles. How many times have we sit there and we said, you need to minister to your neighbor. And you do. <laughs> and that's a great thing to do. But that's not going to do enough. You need to start going after groups and start to see God bringing in the masses. That's revival. When revival happens, you'll know it because you know what? You won't be able to find a seat wherever you go. It's true. There shouldn't be any seats left in this place. We should be in a situation where the buses that are parked out there, I know they're there for a windbreak and thank God they're there, <laughs> but they should be filled with people. They should be so hungry to come here. Why? Not because of the wonderful people that are coming up to speak. But because God's here. I can always tell in our own church. I, I pastor in a church in Denver. When the spirit is really moving. You know why? Because no one leaves. People don't want to leave the presence. You become addicted to it. If you're not addicted to the presence of God... Spend more time there. You will be. There's nothing like it. There is absolutely nothing like spending time in the Father's presence. And you need to start to make it to a point where that is such a priority in your life, you'll give up other things. Now, I don't know what it is in this country. I can tell you what it is in my country. Because <laughs> we have a big football game coming up in about a week. It's called the Super Bowl. And I got news for you. I think they said 150 million people will watch it from the United States. That's half of our country. 150 million people will turn in, and I will be one of them. I talked to my wife today on the phone. We're having a Super Bowl party at my house. <laughs> Who's going to win? Uh, I think the Giants are, actually. Anyway. I <laughs> uh, see. Uh, somebody had to be a Patriots fan. I knew that. Uh, but what's more important? Now, if God came along and said, you know what? I don't want you to watch the game. What do you do? Well, for a lot of people, it'd be like, well, I know God will come back with whatever it is. I want to see the game. But are you willing to lay all of it down? Whatever it is. Whatever your favorite thing is. If you watch movies, are you a person? What is it that has this passion that pulls you toward it so much that you spend all your time there? Because something occupies your time. What is it? And there are a lot of good things out there. But it doesn't matter what the good things are. What matters is what's the God thing. What is it that brings you into His presence? What is it that draws you so close to Him that when you walk away, people are going, something about you. What is it? They want to know who, what, what you've been doing. Because they see it on you. In that time, now you get to actually share what's going on because you know what? It's not you again, it's the Lord. And that's the key to this. We've got to get to a place where what we release is God. That's what Peter did. Can you imagine walking down the streets 
of one of your towns. We were just in Victor Harbor this morning. Can you imagine walking down Main Street in Victor Harbor and everyone who's sick that you walk past gets healed without you saying a word? It works. I've been in places where people come into the meetings and before anyone ever says a word, before the worship team strikes a note, they're getting healed. How's that possible? Because it's about his presence. And you carry his presence. If you're a born-again Christian, you carry the presence of God. The question is, will you release it? <laughs> will you let it come out of you? You know, so many times we're like, well, I don't want to offend anybody, or I don't want to... Really? Why are you worried about offending them? They're not worried about offending you. I mean, I hear people say that, you know, there's a lot of rules in South Australia that are actually anti-Christian in their nature. Did anybody bother worrying about whether that offended you or not? Well, guess what? I don't think God's too worried if they get offended. In fact, he probably is going to do it. I have a lot of people who tell me, well, I, you know, I don't know that God actually does, does those kind of things anymore. I tell them, I understand. Until I started seeing God move, I didn't really know for sure if he was doing it either. What I encourage them to do is come out and start to see God, what God's doing. Start to pray for people. You want to see the sick healed? Pray for them. You want to see limbs grow out? Pray for it. How do you expect to see something happen if you never do it? I've been blessed with that. The Lord's been growing limbs out this last year. That's an unusual one. The very first thing he'd do is he grew out a hand. There was a pastor in Africa who had, had a hand cut off. He had a leather cap on it. <clears throat> and he was praising the Lord. And the Lord just said, I want to grow his hand out. So I'm up on the stage and I'm just praying for him. And the leather cap pops off. And all of a sudden you see this kind of a stub here and then he takes his fingers and does this. And... <laughs> It happens really quick, so watch. <laughs> legs grow out really fast. There's a lot of people over there that had legs that were taken off at the knee by landmines. God in mass started doing it one night, just growing legs out. And it's like, you almost, you, you think, did I actually see what I saw? But you've got to be willing to be there and be a part of what he's doing. We had a young, we had a father bring his daughter. We were meeting his pastors after the Crusades at his private home. And there's a knock on the door. And nobody can figure out where we're at, of course, because we're in a private house. So that made everybody was pretty nervous. And they open the door, and here's a gentleman, and he's holding his daughter in his arms. An eight-year-old girl. And they're like, how did you find this place? The Lord had given him the address. He wrote it down. He had it on a piece of paper. And he came in. His daughter had died four days, four days earlier. We're talking Africa. He carried her. I'm surprised that the faith of the father bringing her in, he did, she didn't raise on the way in, to be honest with you. He brought her in. They had a huge coffee table in the living room. And I said, lay her on the table. And the pastors and I gathered around her and we started to pray in tongues. If you don't pray in tongues, you need to ask God for that gift. It's an extremely powerful gift. It takes us out of the equation. What a wonderful thought. <laughs> we're praying around her. 15, 20 minutes go by. And we're just, we're really, we're crying out in prayer. And her eyelids fluttered and she sat up. From the time she took her from here to here, her skin was perfectly normal. Are you willing to do the things you've not seen done? Are you willing to sit there and say, okay, God, I've heard the stories. I know you do these things. But I also know that I won't see it unless I actually step out and do it. Every one of those pastors now have seen someone raised from the dead. They actually saw two because there was another uh, young boy that came a little bit later. He had been shot through the chest. His father took him out of the morgue and brought him to us. Again, the Lord gave him, his ad gave him the address. I, I checked on that when I got back to the United States. You cannot get a body out of the morgue in the States. <laughs> Apparently in Africa you can. Uh, 
they now have a testimony. They now have an experience that goes beyond anything they had before. Are you willing to let your experiences grow to a point where you have the testimonies? It's great to have people come up here and share the testimonies about what God's doing. I love hearing it. I want to see more of it. I love that part of it. But you know what? If you don't have your own testimony, why not? The very first missions trip I ever went on, I went on with my son. He was graduating from high school. <clears throat> and I said, you know, the Lord told me to take you on a missions trip. And he said, that's great. I don't want to build any buildings. <laughs> and I thought, yes. <laughs> I said, great. You figure out what trip you want to go on. So he picked Todd Bentley. Interesting character. So we're in Nairobi, Kenya, at the airport, waiting to take our flight into Tanzania. And the group had older people, young people. Why Todd decided he needed to talk to me, I don't know. The Lord obviously brought him over. And he said, why are you here? And I told him the truth. I'm tired of telling your stories. I want my own. I love to tell other people's stories. Don't get me wrong. Because you know what? There's power in what's going on. But I want my own stories. And I want each one of you to have your own stories. It's not okay for you to just repeat stories because then all you're doing is a copy of somebody else. And God is tired of copies. You're all an original. Every one of you is unique. You'll be unique in the giftings that God gives to you. You're going to be unique in how you present those giftings. And you're going to have people that you come in contact with that won't, wouldn't talk to me. But they'll talk to you. You know, somebody said something about this anointing. I'm like, I want this anointing on every one of you. You know why? Because there's too many countries to go to. I'm already getting tired. I had over 200,000 miles in the air last year. That's a lot of air travel. And you know what? I know people who do more than that. I want each of you to have such a heart for it that it's on fire and you can't stop it. When people say they have a heart for the nations, you don't understand. There's a burning that's inside of them that won't go away. It's not okay to sit at home. <clears throat> people in my church will come up to me and they say, you know, it's been a couple of months since you've been gone. Aren't you getting antsy? Because they know me. And I'm like, yeah, I am. Because if I have to wait too long in between trips, it starts to, I'm like, oh, I need to get going. I need to get out and do it again. I need to be, not just in the, and we do stuff in the States too, don't get me wrong, and I think that's important for us to do, but my heart is to the nations. That's why God's got me all going all over the place. Why? Because I'm willing. You know, there's a whole lot of people that are better speakers, they have more education, they do all those other things, right? But they're not willing to go anywhere. Randy Clark likes to say he hides his education well. <laughs> he has a, he's going for his PhD right now in theology. But he says that people have told him that he hides his education very well. And I said, you know what? That's what makes him so accessible to everybody. You can be the most educated person in the world, and it's really hard for people to get to know who you are. But if you're real with them, they'll want to know who you are. And so part of what it is is are you willing to be who you are and then go out and do it. Peter started by stepping out of a boat. Think of the faith that was involved for him to do that. I mean, if you notice in the story, the waves didn't stop and then he stepped out of the boat. He stepped out when the waves, when the wind were still going. We sometimes overlook that part of it when we hear that story. We think, well, yeah, you know, Peter's, er, the Lord told him, come to me, Peter. And at that point, the water was still. No, it wasn't. He stepped out in the middle of it, in the middle of the chaos, and went to him. Are you willing to step out of the boat? What's the boat for you? I don't know. It could be your church. It could be this tent. Because you know what? There's comfort here. It's safe. You know, Raph has even said it today. It's a safe place. You can prophesy here. You can do all... Yep, you're right. It is. It's a safe place. Now I get to tell you something really fun. God isn't concerned with your safety. <laughs> he really isn't. I've been on stages with armed guards. 
We've, I've had a chance to preach in several places where we have to have men with AK-47s and submachine guns standing on stage with you. He's not concerned with your safety. That doesn't mean he won't protect you. But he's not concerned with it. He wants you to be willing to step out and do what no one else will do. Will you go to the countries that no one else wants to go to? Will you go to the regions of Australia that no one else wants to go to? Because I know from talking to the people here, there are parts of your country that you're probably scared to go into. And I don't blame you. But I also know that there's some people who have asked me to consider coming back next year to go to those places. And I've said yes. Why? Because I feel God's heart for those people. I know that if I'm doing what the Lord told me to do, I'm protected. How many people here know what the Ku Klux Klan is? Oh, everybody does. Okay, I guess you studied it in, your, in your, one of your classes, huh? There's an African American, which means he is black, okay, in Baltimore. His church sits on land owned by the Ku Klux Klan. Yes, they still exist in our country. You know what he does? He goes down into Baltimore into the uh, areas where the gangs are, the drugs are, and he ministers to people. Numerous times he's had people pull out handguns and put them right to his head. And you know what he tells them? Pull the trigger if you can, because if not, if you can, it's, not my, it's my time to go to be with Jesus and that's, that's fine. And if not, you need to know who he is. Now, I'm not suggesting that you go and let someone put a gun to your head. <laughs> but, he understands who he is, who he belongs to, and who his protector is. You can't scare me with heaven. <laughs> what happens if someone walks through the tent right now and decides to shoot me? Well, if you guys can't raise me from the dead, which with this many people you probably can, but if you can't, I get to go be with Jesus. Not a bad deal. You know, I love being here. I love doing what he's called me to do. And I will continue doing it until the day that I die. Either of natural causes or unnatural ones. But you're not going to scare me by telling me that you're going you're to send me to heaven. <laughs> God is looking for people who will no longer be afraid of it. Look what happened to Peter. Peter. You know, we like to talk about the 3,000. We talk about, what happened to him? He ended up in prison. He was flogged. There was a lot of things that happened to Peter, wasn't there? What about Paul? Now, that's a strange character. Think about him. He, he took great joy when they put him in prison. Don't you think you'd take great joy when someone came along to Billy and said, we're going to throw you in jail because of your beliefs? Are we going to be great men and women of faith and step out and do what God's called us to do? Are we willing to go wherever he tells you to go? For some of you, it could be that he's going to say, you know what, you need to go to Adelaide. Wimps. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. They need to be saved there too, I know. Some of you, he may come along and say, I'm going to send you to Pakistan. That's an eye-opening experience to go there. But you know what? Unless you ask him, you'll never know where he's going to send you. If you're sitting there and you're thinking, oh, God will send an angel with stone tablets that will tell me where to go. <laughs> Probably not going to happen. <laughs> could. It could happen. I mean, he's done it in the past. But generally speaking, it comes because our heart becomes to a point where we say, Lord, I want to do what you're doing so much. Where do you want me to go? I don't care where it is. If you open the door, I'll walk through it. That's the key to moving in what God wants to do. If you're not willing to go to the places that no one else wants to go to, you'll see things. You'll see miracles. Miracles are coming. They're going to be happening all over the place. It's going to become commonplace. And it should. Do you realize we sit here and we talk about the miracles and we talk about like it's some kind of an amazing little thing that only happens over here. It should be the natural Christian life. 
Every one of you should be walking in signs, wonders, and miracles. If you don't believe me, read Matthew 10, 7, and 8. It says, as you go, preach that the kingdom of heaven is near. And what are you supposed to do? Heal the sick, cast out demons, cleanse the lepers. And what was the last one? Raise the dead. Right? And that's for everybody. It isn't supposed to be just Raph running around or the ministers that are up here praying for you. It's supposed to be each one of you. These things follow us. In Mark it says these signs will follow those who believe. The other part that will really get you is I have a question for you. Okay? I'm going to put it in a question form. Did Jesus tell you to pray for the sick? Really? I defy anyone to look in their Bible and show me where Jesus told you to pray for the sick. He told you to heal the sick. <laughs> that messes with all our theology, doesn't it? <laughs> he understood what's in each one of you. When you're born again, you carry him. Releasing that to bring healing to somebody is not a big deal. Is it? God wants to take you out of the box. He is tired of you building a new box. <laughs> I don't know how you are in this country, but in my country, we are great box builders. We break through the box, and we think we have all kinds of freedom, and then we realize we just built a box that was six inches bigger than the last one we were in. It is time for us to destroy the boxes and start to live in the kingdom. If we are going to live in the kingdom, boxes have no place in there. For you to step out like this, though, requires faith. And I'm not talking about the measure of faith that we all have. If you look at the gifts <clears throat> in Corinthians, it talks about a measure of faith that's given to every Christian. But if you really want to step out and do what we're talking about, you have to have the gift of faith. And that's a different thing, because a person with the gift of faith believes there's nothing that God can't do. You see someone come up to you. I was in the Philippines in November preaching at a church in downtown Manila and this gentleman rolls up in a wheelchair. He had polio. Now I've never seen polio before which really freaked my church out because they figured I've seen everything. <laughs> I said, I've never seen this before. 27 years he'd been in a wheelchair. Now I can say, okay Lord, I don't know. I, I know you do this stuff but... No, after everything that God has done in my life, I have to believe one thing. Nothing is impossible. So I started to pray for him. We only prayed about 10 minutes. You know what the Lord said? Ask him if he wants to walk. It isn't the amount of time that you pray for the person. It isn't any of it. it what is it? It's the anointing of God coming through. It's the power of God that's flowing into him. So I asked him, do you want to walk? And he looked at me and he said, yeah. Now we made sure we had a pastor on each side of him because if not, he's going to fall over. He doesn't Think about it, being in a, in a wheelchair for 27 years, your leg muscles are gone. But he got up and walked around that church. Awesome. Will you be willing to step out knowing that God can do anything? And, and the reality is it's not that he can do it, but that he will do it. You know, faith is not knowing that God can do something. Even the demons know that. They know that he's all-powerful. They know all those things that we've talked about over the last couple of days. But faith is not knowing that he can do it. It's knowing that he will do it. You walk into the situation already understanding God won. You walk into the situation with such an amount of this knowledge in your own mind and in your heart that says, I don't care what comes through that door. God's bigger than it. And he's going to make it happen. No matter what it is. That way you can walk into a situation and speak to whatever it is. We don't have to come as beggars because that's not who you are. You're sons and daughters of the king of the universe. Act like it. Have you ever been around royalty? Real royalty? I've had the pleasure of being on a Emirates Airlines once with the royal family from the United Arab Emirates. 
they act very differently than everybody else because they know who they are. They're generous. They're very polite. They're very sweet people, actually. And they carry themselves in a different way. We need to carry ourselves in a different way. We need to be generous. Because everything you have was given to you, so giving it away shouldn't be a problem, should it? I always like to tell people the easiest way to be generous is consider my, my saying I've got Bill's wallet and I'm going to give out of it. I can be very generous if it's his money, can't I? Wait till tonight. <laughs> the issue is when we adopt the lifestyle of God and be his sons and daughters. In that setting, it changes everything. Because as a son or daughter of the king, when you speak something forth, everyone listens to it, don't they? When I was on that airplane with them, it was amazing. I mean, the, the staff that was taking care of them was extremely attentive because they knew who they were. When we walk into a place, people should be very attentive because of who we are. When you come in and you're talking about the kingdom of your father and you're releasing it, Think what you're doing. You're changing their lives forever. And if you've got the will to go out and do that, God will release it. But you have to have faith to believe it. Most of us hear it and we go, oh yes, I understand that. No, you don't. Because it's not what's up here, it's what's in here. Most of what we have stays up here and never makes the one foot jump. Because you can be taught everything. I can sit up here and teach you how to pray for the sick. I can teach you how to open blind eyes and deaf ears. I can do all of that. Because I've seen it done. But until it becomes here, you'll never do it. Until it becomes your heart, you'll never actually step out and do what God's telling you to do. If you sit there and have all this head knowledge, what good did it do you? Not a thing. You know, if it was about intellectualisms, the Pharisees would have been the first ones in line. It's true, isn't it? They were the scholars of the day. They knew, they knew the Word better than anyone. And there's nothing wrong with knowing the Word. Believe me, I think you need to know the Word. But the fact is, if that's all you have and you have nothing else to back it up with, it's just head knowledge. It's time for you to get past head knowledge and have heart knowledge. Get to a place where when you step out of this tent and you see the person that's walking down the street and they're on crutches, they're not supposed to be on crutches. I love it when I take people to Africa. The first day, you always see people walking around and maybe have a, a sling on their arm or something and the whole team is kind of nervous and they're sitting around like, okay, well, who's going to go over and pray for them? And I love to watch it. By the end of the week, you know what happens when they see them? The person gets mobbed. <laughs> Because they can't wait to see God move on them. That's where you need to be. You need to be at a point where when you see something, you react to it and go after it. And if you're not willing to do that, you won't see God move the way you want to. I made a deal with the Lord. I told him a long time ago, Lord, I will pray for the sick no matter what. There are times when I'm overseas, I don't get into my room until 3 in the morning. Because I want to make sure every person who came to get prayer gets prayer. That's not a great thing that doesn't make me noble. It just simply makes it to the point of I understand they need to be touched. Are you willing to lay down your comfort? What's important to you? Because it may not be important to God. Some of the issues that we think are so important, he's sitting up there going, well, not so much on that one. We need to find out what touches his heart. And then go after it. Because if you're going after what's on the heart of God, you'll never be the same. And I can guarantee you, when you start to minister the kingdom of the Father, you'll never be the same. And you'll never go back to anything else. Because there's only one thing that matters. Getting as many people into the family as possible until between now and when the Lord returns. You know, that's hard for us sometimes because some of the people that he brings into the kingdom, we go, I don't know if I'd take that one <laughs> And I'm sure there's someone who probably looks at you and goes, I don't know if I'd take that one. He wants them all. He wanted us and he wants everyone else. 
And so it's time for us to step out of the boat. It's time for us to risk it. If we're not willing to risk, you will never see things happen. Risk, faith is spelled R-I-S-K. You have to be willing to risk everything. What's the worst thing that's going to happen if you pray for someone and they don't get healed? You might look foolish. Have you ever gone to, I think rugby is the big sport down here, isn't it? AFL? Somebody over there is a rugby player. How many screaming fans do you have in a stadium that look like complete idiots? <laughs> I mean, okay, the Super Bowl will have 105,000 people in the stadium screaming their heads off, painted in the colors of their team, making complete fools of themselves. And everyone thinks it's normal. And we're afraid to go up and pray for this person and worry that, oh my gosh, I pray for him and nothing happens. I'm going to look foolish. You behave yourself. <laughs> Whose fool are you going to be? You're going to be foolish for something. I guarantee it. That's our human nature. Are you going to look foolish for Jesus? You're going to look foolish for something far less important. What's it going to be? But I believe if you're going to have the ability to step out of that boat, you need the gift of faith. And so what I believe God wants to do today is release to you a gift of faith. Now, when you receive a gift, what do you need to do with it? Thank you. Someone said use it. <clears throat> There's a lot of people who will tell you if you don't use a gift within a couple of weeks, you'll lose it. I don't believe that, but I do believe in one thing. If you don't use it, you'll believe that it quit working and you won't, won't activate it. So... If you're going to come up front to get a gift of faith that we're going to release to you today, I want you to actually go out and step out and do something with it. I don't want to ha hear from Raph that, yeah, it was a great meeting, but nothing's really come out of it. I want to hear, yeah, it was a great meeting. You know what? This whole region's on fire for God. Because everyone that you're coming into contact with is overwhelmed by the presence of the Lord and it's changing lives. That's the key thing that we're looking for. So if you want to receive a gift of faith, I want you to come up here and line up on the line, and I'm going to ask the pastors that are, the ministers that are here to come up here and help me pray for people. <clears throat> They're going to sing a song as we're getting ready here that actually talks about exactly what we've been doing. Front row forward, okay. Where are the rest of these pastors? scripture and it's just drawn into God. We want this healing. Don't we want this anointing? Don't you want to be on fire for God? That's what this song's about.